Now, equally impressive have been the ways in which we've been able to deliver or our delivery methodologies. So instead of running units or classes for four to six people, we're now seeing some academic visionaries run classes of 90 students with three demonstrators in a quasi-tutorial practical. Now that's a really interesting concept. And again, when you see the fluidity of these things run, the students moving the furniture and moving it to align to their activity, you can get a sense here that there's not too many people who aren't engaged. You can see just about everyone's focusing on what's happening, yet they've moved everything to suit their own requirements for that class. And increasingly, these spaces obviously open up some fantastic opportunities for competitive environments where an, op an experiment like this, the students have spent all semester designing a small structural object like a bridge. Now they're coming back together as their entire cohort to pit their design against their colleagues. Now it's not a competition, but I can assure you once they get into that room with two to 400 students, it becomes a really big competition. So the atmosphere is electric. So at this point, when it's just broken, the rule goes up and you get, to, you get a sense of the students actually really get a great deal out of this. But the greatest part for me is what happens in this area, which is the garden lounge. This is the front area before they've walked into that big laboratory. In the past, the students would have come in, broken a bridge and go again. Now we're able to capture them before they go in and when they come out and they're talking to their colleagues, they're sharing their story, they're telling each other what worked and what different didn't. We can't measure that. We, we can't say whether that's fantastic or not, but I, from the comments, if you're in the room, you get a sense of how important that is to the students. <laughs> Additionally, some really funny things have happened. The event we're looking at here is the uh, Engineering Careers Expo. So this is an event that used to be held on Main Drive or up at the Kidney Lawn. So we're now getting the organisations, so Leightons, et cetera, to come in, but they're coming to the home of engineering now. They're not coming to a space that uh, is sort of... Um, in between where the students are and where they are, they're now coming to a space familiar to the students. And this is really important because you see students grab the employer and show them something. They're now seeing what the students learn in these spaces. And these events have become so successful that in a week's time from now, IT are running exactly the same event in the same area for their students. So it's interesting to see how we can capitalise upon space, not just for teaching and learning. And obviously these areas have become import increasingly important for marketing exercises. So here we can see one of our technicians taking a short course for some churchy students. The tours through these areas have been exponential. But the interesting thing is they've changed from just plain tour to that of tour and activity. So the high schools are now leveraging the same practical experiments we've got to engage their students. So again, we're getting a chance to talk to them and to engage with them and give them a taste of university life before they've come here. It's obviously not delivered at the same level we do to our own students. And they make fantastic backdrops for some of our um, uh, marketing photos. So Katrina McDonald, who has nothing whatsoever to do with an Ibby ball, is holding one. <laughs> but you can see in the background in the machine a small vertebrae that she has been working on. The motorsport area is by far and away the, the number one stop for all of our tours. Uh, regardless of age or interest, this area seems to capture imagination more than most. Um, so it's always kept, and then half the beauty about this is all the area is always kept in this state so we can run tours and we're not always cleaning up. And for those who have a very keen eye, Alini here is now on the faculty's new website. Um, so the areas are more than just teaching and learning spaces. What we can capitalise upon these spaces is really, really interesting. So the future of these environments, well, we've been testing some hybrid models where we have a virtual demonstrator on a physical piece of gear. So now the students come in and can talk, liaise with their virtual demonstrator on the left via a touch screen, but they can still do a physical hands-on device. And we're not arguing that this should replace any of the others. We're just saying this is a nice factor for those students who might miss out, who might not be able to make it through workload commitments, can still run an experiment. Yet it's obviously a small area of students we're trying to capture here. We're not trying to replace everything. And similarly, many universities are now investing in the lab share, which allows students to complete practical experiments through an online portal, which is slightly different. That brings us to our first million dollar question. If, we've able, if we're able to transform the spaces from this to this in the laboratory environment, what is the potential in the teaching and learning environment? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, obviously for this presentation, but more so because I think the answer lies here. And I think most people would agree. And there's a great way I can explain this to you, and that's by taking a slice through level five. This is perhaps the best example of an evolution of teaching spaces at QUT. Because if we look at the top left-hand side, we can see a lecture theatre, a very didactic, 
academically led discussion. If we go to the middle, we see some interactivity through this area here. But more importantly, if we look here, here, and here, we get what's called flexible delivery areas. And this is incredibly exciting. And the reason it's exciting, because in an attempt to validate these spaces, the university has prepared a trial space in O Block at Gardens Point. The room known as O303A has been running for about 12 months in the experimental phase, running a series of units and, and um, courses. And what's most exciting about this space is how simple it looks. It's a relatively empty space. It's got mobile tables and chairs. It starts to look to sim similar to some of the other spaces we've seen, yet it's supported by some fantastic computing. What it means we can do is start to set up multiple configurations in the space. So much like we looked at the laboratories earlier, we're now able to configure them about, so the, the computer we call a cow or a computer on wheels. We've got two tables and we can allow nine students at each group. Or we can set it up in a movie style layout, which is wonderful for individual or group presentations. Or we have a herd of cows around the outside of the room and we can manage it centrally from the middle position. And this is our second million dollar question and probably the most important if we know that we based our journey on this simple formula and we know the experience we want to create and we know what the space can do, the question is obviously what activities are best to run in the space? Is it the same activities we would run in our normal spaces? And the answer is obviously no. The answer is a student-driven approach. So we want to put the students in the driver's seat. We want active participants. So the way we've done this is to trial some different activities in the room. And the example we're using here is a first year unit, first year, first semester, engineering and sustainability. There's something very special about engaging with first year students and those who have had the opportunity, you'll know it's a real gift. But in this room, it does things that we wouldn't have ever expected it to do. It is only a room. What happens is obviously up to the staff involved. But I've been lucky enough to teach in there for two semesters now, so I've got some insight into what the future might look like. One of the ch most challenging things you can do with a group of students in first year is get them in a group. And I think most people will un absolutely understand that. Yet it happens completely incidental, incidentally in this room by way of the furniture layout. So something that's been quite challenging and quite forced and quite awkward now becomes something that just happens. The students can obviously swap if they want to, but they form groups around the layout of the room. So the next thing we try to do is leverage the technology, those cows, as providing some centrality for the students. So something for them to focus on because putting a group of first year students in a circle doesn't always work. But if we've got some form of centrality for them to focus on, that does. So in this particular class we're talking about here, they're looking at sustainable design. So rather than looking at some third world design, we've brought it close to home and we want to look at some particular bridge or structure that may be called sustainable. Now that's the photo in the middle there. And what we've said to the students in, in previous classes, I would have put a slide up, much like I've put up here, and then we would explain to the students what makes it sustainable, provide the literature, hope they went away and read it and did some homework and then come back and talk about it. We all know that doesn't always work that way. So what we did is gave the students the picture. That's it. Nothing else. We wanted to see if the students could work as a group, could manipulate the technology to see if they could find what is it? Why is it sustainable? Where is it? Why is it important? And the most remarkable thing was they all did it far quicker than I could have done it. In fact, I tried it and sort of failed dismally. Yet all of the students found it. But, and, and that's great, they found the information. But what's more interesting are the tangents they found along the way. Because as the students are searching, each of them is teaching, showing each other what they should be doing, what they should be searching for. They've only been in groups for two weeks, only been at university a couple of weeks. So they're staggered at the freedom of how they're learning this information. But when we look closely, and I'm sorry this is a bit fuzzy, you get a sense of what happened during this class. All of the students are now yelling at each other and pointing at the screen. They're yelling across the table. And what's happening is they're talking, saying, no, do this, no, do that, because they've only got one keyboard. It's not like a normal computer room where they're all searching on their own, then come back and they've found their own things. They're now saying, hey, that's interesting, woo, stay there, or go and have a look at that one. No, click Google third one down. Don't click the first one. So it's fascinating what happens. So in that particular class, it worked really well to try and get an outcome from the students at the end of the semester. One of the only measures we can do that on is Lex. And obviously, the Lex was fine for that particular class. It's very difficult to find out for that particular class. But generally, the feedback from the students was very good. What is more interesting is perhaps what happened this semester. Because the second example takes a second year, second semester class 
which is effectively engineering drawing. We're taking students into a room and teaching them how to draw and develop these sort of schematics. Now, we always use CAD and a whole variety of computer technologies to do this now, but it's fundamental that the students understand how to do some of the first principles. So it is arguably very questionable whether you'd make any gains at all by adding technology to an event like this. Yet what we did is tried to leverage, again, the computers as a central focal point so the students could still be in groups. But what we did is then leverage the Australian standards to create that centrality. And for those who have ever looked at the Australian standards, you'll imagine what a challenge that could be. But fortunately, the university only has four licences. <laughs> what that means is we have six groups. So students rush into the class, quickly log on, try to get to the standards before their group friends do. And of course, the reward is then they get to drive the entire class for the rest of the hour period. So they're the ones who choose, we're going to do this activity this week. Of course, we're supporting them, showing them which direction to take. But obviously, you get students coming earlier and earlier and earlier, and they're talking amongst their groups. So when we look at this class, it's significantly different to the first one. But what's interesting is we've got some students looking at Google, trying to find out what the information is, or looking at the standards, where the other ones are just heads down. Now, this is the sort of event that we used to do in normal tutorial rooms with desks laid out. That meant, generally, the students could only speak to one person this side, one person this side, and very difficult to find what they're doing. Whereas in this sort of layer, we've now got students who are being very collaborative. There's nothing to gain by keeping it to yourself in this sort of class. They have to get an activity completed in the hour. The sharing that happens simply by being able to move the furniture is quite incredible. So the two, two stories we've got, which are only little stories, but they're very impressive for what could be achievable. But for me, this picture best captures O303A, what it is. We've got students engaged in some sort of technology. This comes from the first unit of sustainability. In fact, we got some, as I was taking the photo, we got one student jumped up, so impressed that he wanted to start pointing at the screen. It wasn't a touch screen, but he was that enthralled and that engaged in the exercise, they were really getting into it. So for me, that picture best captures what the possibilities are. So we spoke earlier about having an opportunity to see what the essence of a laboratory learning setting may be. And, and the beauty is now we've got something to match it up to with what the future of active learning may be. And they're very, very similar things. In fact, I think we're heading more towards a self-directed, what I'd call a critical engagement phase, that we're able to let the students lead the way with some guidance. What you would have seen in all of those is the lack of a demonstrator. There wasn't a central core content person at the front. Of course, there was someone in the room, but they were providing support and guidance on the way through. So I guess the future for me, and I honestly believe that with STP coming along and with all these spaces now, and I think we're creating some more spaces before STP even gets here, that we're seeing an opportunity not only to better provide better experiences for our students, but to engage in a much more meaningful level. And when you can do that, the rewards are significant as an instructor. Thank you. <laughs>